good evening to everyone. Unfortunately, something very urgent came up and Professor Dimopoulos will not be able to join the meeting. However, on behalf of him and myself, uh, I would like to thank the Organizing and Scientific Committee for this uh, very kind invitation. And I will try to provide the best way I can uh, this update on clinical trials, clinical trials for COVID-19 treatment. And uh, as we all know, it is well documented that COVID-19 is primarily manifested as a respiratory tract infection. However, emerging data indicate that it should be regarded as a systemic disease involving multiple systems, including cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, neurological, hematopoietic, and immune system. So here you can see the clinical trials that were initiated through the past few months with the blue line. These are the new trials that were initiated. And with the red line, you can see the cumulative amount of trials that were initiated the past few months. Uh, this is a very recent slide from Clinical Trials Go, and you can see an impressive number of 1,982 studies that were found for COVID-19 today. And these clinical trials were registered in several trial registries, mainly in Clinical Trials Gov. Now, regarding the intervention type of registered trials, the main intervention types were drugs, were advanced therapy medicinal products, and clinical characteristics of the disease, while the most commonly studied drugs and ATMPs were hydroxychloroquine, plasma, and azithromycin. As you can see, the most common study locations were China, United States of America, France, Iran, Spain, Germany, etc. And let's start with remdesivir. As we all know, it's an antiviral nucleoside analog product, an RNA polymerase inhibitor, and it was used to treat Ebola and Marburg virus infections. These are all the clinical trials that were initiated with remdesivir. Some of them are still recruiting, some are active but not recruiting. And remdesivir was shown to reduce time to clinical improvement in patients with COVID-19, while no improvement in mortality was demonstrated so far. Here you can see the big study of remdesivir, the ACTT study, which actually was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of intravenous remdesivir in adults who were hospitalized with COVID-19 diagnosis with evidence of lower respiratory tract involvement. 1,059 patients were enrolled, and it was shown improvement in time to clinical recovery from 15 days to a median of 11 days. Remdesivir patients also had better survival by 14 days compared with placebo. Another study of remdesivir performed by Capital Medical University was a phase three study which included 237 patients. However, this study did not show any significant improvement in clinical symptoms, although those receiving remdesivir very early in the disease course, meaning that the symptoms had a duration of less or equal to 10 days, had faster time to clinical improvement compared with placebo, although this difference was not statistically significant. The simple trials with remdesivir was two trials, a phase three trial for patients with moderate COVID-19, where the five-day course of remdesivir showed 65% clinical improvement versus the standard of care at day 11, while the 10-day course showed 31% clinical improvement. However, this was not statistically significant. While in the, the second study was another phase three trial with 397 hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19 disease this time, where the five-day course of remdesivir versus the 10-day course of remdesivir was uh, not statistically significant. There was no difference. Now, in Japan, uh, it seems that it is the only country so far that has approved remdesivir for COVID-19 COVID disease. The FDA, however, has allowed the use of remdesivir for COVID-19 patients under an emergency use authorization based on the preliminary results of the ACTT, ACTT trial. The UK has provided a positive scientific opinion under the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, while EMA recommends that patients can receive the drug only under compassionate use programs. Now we move on to hydroxychloroquine and fluorokine. Uh, the main indication for these two compounds were malaria, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and porphyria cutanea tarda. 
And the rationale was that both compounds had demonstrated in vitro and in vivo activity against the novel coronavirus. These are all the trials that are recruiting or not uh, with hydroxychloroquine. And the data are beginning to indicate a potential lack of efficacy for this compound as treatment for COVID-19 disease. This is uh, due to the fact that most trials have a low quality of evidence, making it extremely difficult to draw firm conclusions, and at least one trial has been stopped currently due to adverse drug events. Here you can see the main trials. In the first trial, 368 veterans diagnosed with COVID-19 were randomized to receive either hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin, 130 patients, hydroxychloroquine monotherapy, 97 patients, and there was a reduction in the use of mechanical ventilation compared with the control arm. And there was a high risk of mortality, however, with hydroxychloroquine monotherapy compared with the control arm. Another observational study included 811 patients out of approximately 1,500 consecutive patients in a single center in New York who received hydroxychloroquine and there was no association at all between the use of the drug and intubation or death, although the patients who received the drug were more likely to have severe cases of COVID-19. In another retrospective cohort, again from New York State, approximately uh, 500 patients received hydroxychloroquine with and without azithromycin again, and this did not have improved in-hospitality mortality rates compared with the standard of care. Moving on to a very big trial, which included approximately 96,000 patients hospitalized for COVID-19, uh, this trial found that there was a high risk of mortality and the novel clinical significant ventricular arrhythmias in those patients who received hydroxychloroquine or fralokine with and without azithromycin compared with those patients that received no therapy. Actually, this study was recently retracted from Lancet on 4th of June due to several questions that were raised about the clarity of the data. Another study about this compound, the chloro-COVID-19 study, halted recruitment due to safety concerns because 25% of the patient who received the 600 mg dose of chloroquine twice daily for 10 days experienced extreme QTC prolongation and this led to higher mortality rates than in the other treatment arts. Uh, furthermore, hydroxychloroquine was also studied in another setting and it was found that it was not effective in preventing patients from developing the disease after receiving the drug within the first four days of a high-risk exposure. And uh, so the results were that FDA actually authorized the emergency use of this compound for COVID-19 patients only when clinical trial participation was not possible and the potential benefit to, for the patient outweighed the potential risk. Both FDA and EMEA have repeatedly warned against using hydroxychloroquine outside of hospital and outside of the setting of clinical trials. And now moving on to another treatment strategy, covalescent plasma. Actually, this is antibodies from blood donated by people who recovered from the illness, and uh, it's, uh, it belongs to the immunoglobulin medication class. The rationale behind that was that the researchers theorized that covalescent plasma could be used as passive immunotherapy as in other coronavirus, coronaviruses such as MERS in the past in order to help neutralize the virus. Here you can see the main mechanisms of action of covalescent plasma against the infection, both immune and non-immune mechanisms. And here are the main clinical trials that are currently ongoing regarding covalescent plasma. The evidence so far was based on case series with different disease severity. However, those patients were administered with other treatment regimens at the same time, and the 90% experience of positive outcomes could not be distinguished whether it was due to the other treatment regimens or due to the covalent plasma. At the USA FDA expanded access program for COVID-19 however reported that covalent plasma is safe for use. This was a preprint and based on the results of a prospective study which enrolled 25 patients, 19 of them approximately 76% with severe disease showed at least one point of clinical improvement. Very recently, a randomized clinical trial from China with 130 patients enrolled with severe disease 
showed that there was clinical improvement in approximately 52% of the patients who received the plasma versus 43% for those who did not. The trial was halted early due to the decrease in new cases, and the author stated that this trial was quite underpowered due to the slow enrollment rate. This study, a similar study, has also started in Greece. Six Greek hospitals are currently enrolling patients. The duration of the study is expected to be approximately 20 months, and 100 patients are going to be enrolled in the main cohort. The primary endpoint is overall survival at three weeks, one month, and two months post-enrollment, and main contributors of the study are the National Blood Donor Center, the Pasteur Institute, and the National Cancer Institute. Here is a very nice photo from the first plasmapheresis performed in our site. And the plasma recipients in this protocol need to be aged above 18 with confirmed infection with molecular techniques from nasopharyngeal swab, and the symptoms related to the disease need to be more, no more than 12 days from the enrollment. Patients with severe disease and critical disease under enrolled the study, and severe and critical disease is defined as described in the protocol. Until today in Greece, 250 volunteers have been tested as plasma donors, 53 of them have undergone plasmapheresis, while nine patients with COVID-19 diagnosis have already been treated with plasma. So the FDA allowed the use of covalescent plasma from recovered cases of COVID-19 for patients with serious or immediately life-threatening COVID-19 infections under an emergency investigational new drug application. Moving on to some other agents that have already been mentioned, Favilavir and Avifavir are antiviral agents that are currently studied in several clinical trials in China, Japan, Canada, and Russia. However, the recent data appears to show lack of efficacy of Favilavir in treating COVID-19. It is, however, approved in China and Italy to treat the disease, while Avivavir, a generic form of Avigan, has been approved to treat COVID-19 disease in Russia. Now, Caletra, the combination of lopinavir and nitonavir, it's a, an antiretroviral drug combination. It's an HIV protease inhibitor, and the rationale be behind that was that it was effective against SARS, showing in vitro activity against the disease back in 2004. Actually, countries that were hard hit by COVID-19, such as Italy, have recommended the drug combination as a treatment for the novel coronavirus. Here you can see the clinical trials that are currently ongoing and uh, including uh, Caletra. And in the first study, 127 patients were randomized to one to receive the combination of interferon, Caletra and Ribavirin, or Caletra alone. The combination therapy was much more effective than Caletra alone in terms of reducing the time from start of study to a negative achievement of a negative nasopharyngeal swab. Now, moving on to another study with Caletra, it was a randomized clinical trial, no therapeutic benefits for Caletra in patients with severe COVID-19 versus the control arm. And there was also no difference from uh, standard of care in the time to clinical improvement, while mortality at 28 days was similar in both groups. Moving on to Tosilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 receptor antagonist, which was approved for rheumatoid arthritis and um, other rheumatological um, diseases. The rationale was that the research from China had demonstrated that Tosilizumab could be effective as a treatment for patients with severe disease. You can see the two trials that are currently ongoing. And the preliminary results from the core immuno-19 study with 129 patients who were randomized to receive either tocilizumab or placebo showed that actually the drug improved significantly the clinical outcomes and the pneumonia associated with COVID-19, according to a very recent press release. In this preprint, tocilizumab was also associated with a 45% reduction in mortality and actually also improved clinical outcomes compared with those patients that did not receive the therapy. In another study with tocilizumab, the covid bio -B study, which was performed in Italy, 65 patients received either tocilizumab or standard of care, and it was also shown that tocilizumab improved the clinical outcomes 69% versus 61% and also reduced mortality. In the preprint of this study, 11 patients with severe disease 
who required ventilation saw that oscillismab reduced the SRP levels of those patients but did not actually result in significant improvement either in temperature or oxygen requirements. Another antagonist of interleukin-6 is sarilumab, which is also indicated for rheumatoid arthritis and currently is studied in two different trials, as you can see in the slide. The preliminary data are shown in the slide, and actually the problem was that this uh, compound was um, concomitantly administered with other treatments, so we cannot make, um, we can, it's not clear whether it was sarilma or the other treatments that were uh, that provided the actual benefit. Moving on to canakinumab, it's a human monoclonal antibody that targets interleukin 1b. You can see the approved indication of the compound. There is a trial currently ongoing, both in uh, the EU and the United States. And uh, some other compounds that I will not focus on are ravulizumab, a human monoclonal antibody, which is an inhibitor of the C5 complement. Uh, currently ongoing on a trial, atalabrutinib. It's a BTK inhibitor which is approved for maglin cell lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The early data from this trial showed that atalabrutinib might be effective in reducing respiratory distress syndrome, which is caused by the disease. So we're waiting for more results. Dabacliflozin, which is an oral sodium glucose co transported 2 inhibitor, and currently is studied in a phase 3 trial. Ivermectin, which is an anti helminthic actually tested uh, at this time in Japan in a clinical trial. The AIDD 2801, an oral broad spectrum antiviral, an ongoing clinical trial currently evaluating the role of this compound uh, against the disease. Mabrilimumab, a monoclonal antibody which antagonizes GMCCSF signaling. CD24FC, which is a recombinant fusion protein. Lenzilumab, uh, an anti-human GCMSF monoclonal antibody, again. Another one, humanized IgG4 monoclonal antibody, an antagonist of CCR5 as well. And Gimsilimumab, a human monoclonal antibody, again, against GMCCSF. Otilimab, another monoclonal antibody, again, which is antagonizing GMCCSF. Inopals, nitric oxide, again, studied in a phase three trial. And to conclude, only Redesibrin has currently received emergency use authorization for use against COVID-19 from FDA. However, the monoclonal antibodies have shown extremely promising activity, but they have not been licensed yet. There are several controversies regarding the most appropriate, let's say, clinical trial endpoint for these uh, studies. However, the vaccine development, I think, is going to be the one that will give a solution to all the problems caused by the pandemic. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and close the presentation.